Life Management Science Labs would like to acknowledge that we live and produce this podcast on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people. We'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands of our listeners and our international colleagues. We'd like to thank and pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Hi everyone and welcome to On The House, the Household Management Science Insights podcast produced by LMSL, the Life Management Science Labs. We are champions of life management science, providing structured insights informed by science and inspired by practice on key aspects of conscious living. Each week we bring you scientific and practical insights on each element with the expert knowledge of professionals in the field. I'm your host, Gabriella Yastra, coming to you from NAM, Melbourne, Australia. Let's begin. Hi everyone and welcome back to the show. Today we're going to be talking about eco-friendly houses, energy saving, recycling and green spaces. And we're talking to Denny Gunawan, who is a postdoctoral research associate in the Particles, Particles and Catalysis Research Group within the School of Chemical Engineering at the University of New South Wales. Wow, what a mouthful. Thanks for joining me today. Thanks, Skeb. Um, so first of all, I'd love to learn a bit more about you and, um, yeah, the work you've been doing and what brought you here. Yep. Thank you so much here for the kind introduction. Uh, it's really great to join you today. Uh, and thank you so much for the invitation. So my name is Danny Gunawan. I'm a research associate at the University of New South Wales, Australia. Uh, I'm currently doing a research in you know, the development of a new process or a new technology to basically harvest renewable solar energy to make sustainable chemicals and fuels that can be used for our daily lives. Wow, that's so complicated. I I, I have no idea even where to start. Uh, what brought you into this area? Well, uh, I'm basically really have a, you know, uh, high passion in sustainability. So, uh, the topic in sustainability really interests me. So I'm pursuing uh, a degree in chemical engineering. And in fact, uh, I was doing my bachelor's degree back in Indonesia in chemical engineering as well. Uh, and the topic is also revolving around sustainability. Uh, so it's really great. We have, you know, a conversation about sustainability right now that indicates that more people now, you know, have concerns in sustainability and climate change. Mm, I've definitely seen that with the people I've talked to. Um, I mean, possibly because we're approaching people who are involved in sustainability, but I mean, I really love that we are able to share this information and, you know, be part of the conversation, you know, encouraging sustainability for everyone. Yep. That sounds good. Mm. Yeah. Uh, so we're going to move on to a section called, have you met Denny? This is where we get to know you through some of your favorite things. And the first thing I'd like to know is what is your favorite book? Okay, uh, I'll start with saying that I'm a book one, so I really love reading books like a lot. Uh, mm -hmm. And one of my favorite books, I think that I recently read, I want to bring it up today is uh, called Quiet, uh, The Power of Introverts. You may already know it because it's a famous book by Susan Cain. Uh, so basically the books like uh, really interest me because it changed my mind, to be honest, about how I feel introversion and extroversion. Because uh, especially in the middle of the world that people tend to think that to be successful, you have to be extroverts. You have to be like easygoing and that stuff. But this book really tells that sometimes introvert people have uh, some unique abilities, I would say, and different approach probably compared to extrovert people. And to be honest, I tend to be an introvert person and that's why I, it's really changed my mind about how I look on myself as well. Like also embracing my tendency to be an introvert. So that's really an insightful book and highly recommend definitely. Mm. It's funny because I feel like maybe it's the people I know, but I feel like everyone sort of self-identifies as an introvert. But if everyone's an introvert, then... <laughs> um, Obviously, you have to be successful um, because otherwise, I think um, we wouldn't really be getting anywhere. So that's an interesting book. I think I'm going to have to read that because, um, yeah, I do self-identify as well as an introvert. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Because the definition between introvert and extrovert is not that clear anyway, right? We, yeah. we know that it's a definition like introvert as well, like between introvert and extrovert. I don't think people can be 100% introvert, 100% extrovert. 
Because sometimes, mm. even if we tend to be extrovert, we need some time to be alone as well. Like me time, I'll say. Yeah, exactly. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and have you watched any movies recently that you enjoyed? Well, uh, I'm not really a movie person, but yeah, mm-hmm. as I say, I'm a movie person. But uh, I think one movie that really interests me, although it's not really new, is Don't Look Up. Okay, It's a mm-hmm. famous movie. I believe you know it already. Uh, why I love this movie? Probably because the one of the actresses is Jennifer Lawrence, which is really pretty. No, I just get it. <laughs> uh, basically, I like this movie because it has like set perfect balance, I would say, between humor and also mm-hmm. like commentary on um, contemporary issues. I would say like how the technology impact society and then about climate change. And then about what happened if we, as a human, don't take urgent approach where we have like urgent problems like climate change. I think this is really interesting. Uh, but also at the same time, they uh, tell the story or the movie in an engaging way. So there are some humors inside of it. So it's really interesting and a really absorbing movie for me, especially for those who are interested in sustainability. Uh, but it's fun if you're not interested in sustainability, this is definitely highly recommend. Mm-hmm. I think it's great when, you know, we need we need educational things, but I think we also need entertainment. And I think mixing the two, you know, really creates something that you can feel good about, but also be entertained by. Absolutely. And do you listen to any podcasts? I'm, yeah, actually, yeah. Uh, I think... You already aware that I wrote a several articles in the conversation because I get mm-hmm. the invitation because of one the article actually. Mm-hmm. So uh, when I wrote for the conversation, I actually like doing re- a little bit of research on the uh, contents, and one of the content is podcasts. And mm-hmm. one of the podcasts that really interests me from the conversation is called Fear and Wonder. This is also highly recommend, especially if you're interested in sustainability, because. Uh, they basically gather climate scientists, climate activists uh, to talk about climate change and sustainability issue. Uh, and, you know, it's really interesting because they really highlight that in terms of climate change, there are a lot of uncertainties. Okay. As a scientist, we even don't know exactly how to, you know, combat this climate change issue. Okay. How to solve it. We really don't know it. But the wonder, it's actually the interesting part because it will lead us to a learning journey and then find uh, the most efficient way in tackling the sustainability problem or the climate crisis that we're currently facing. So highly recommend it as well. You can check in the conversation website, the conversation Australia specifically. Mm-hmm. And if you don't know the conversation, um, I think you should check that out as well. It's a great resource for anyone who wants to learn a bit more and learn from the experts themselves. Um, and do you have a role model? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, I've always seen my PhD supervisor, Professor Rosama at the University of New South Wales as my role model. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, I really, really admire her dedication and also her passion in transforming our energy landscape that is currently heavily relied on fossil fuels through chemical engineering. Uh, and you know, trying to shift things from fossil resources to renewable energy resources. And the other thing that really fascinates me from, you know, her passion and dedication is also that she, she also put a lot of attention on the next generation, on young generation, because uh, it's really important to actually nurture the next generation in STEM field, science, technology, engineering, because uh, our current problem in the world is so complicated like climate change and then water scarcity and other stuff so we really need good people good young generation in this field science technology and engineering so i really admire her dedication not only on the energy transition topic but also in education and research Mm, i guess that you know the the problems that we're tackling are so complex it's not it's going to take more than one generation to fix yes definitely mm. definitely yeah and it must be great to be able to work with your role model so directly um i yes. don't think everyone gets that opportunity yeah great um and have you completed any courses that have inspired you 
Yes, uh, I actually recently finished my PhD back on August. Uh, so my degree is in chemical engineering, as I said before, and my research revolves around sustainability, especially on solar energy. So the reason I took that course is uh, because I'm interested in sustainability. And uh, in fact, recently I took a course provided by the United Nations that uh, here I would like to recommend to everyone to, you know, join if you have time. So the course called Sustainable uh, Lifestyle, if not mistaken, yeah, Sustainable Lifestyles. So uh, I think everyone can understand the content. It's not really technical because it's about uh, highlighting about how our lifestyle options or our lifestyle choices can actually have a very significant impact on the world around us. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I, I was to be honest, like surprised on how the, the, the scale of the impact of how our lifestyle choice can affect uh, the world around us, the sustainability and definitely highly recommend. And it all also changes your mind, kind of change your mind uh, to think about uh, when to think about the next generation, not not just think about fulfilling our needs at the moment, at this generation, but also think about uh, the generations to come because they also need like a lot of resources as well, right? So we really need to think beyond our generations. Yeah, amazing. And this course, is it available online for everyone? Yes, it's free actually. You can have oh, a check on the United Nations website. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, I'll make sure that goes into our show notes so everyone can check that out. And I think I'm going to be giving that a go as well. Yeah, that's it. Okay. So um, I like to start the podcast by, you know, introducing a few terms so that, you know, we know what we're talking about and we're all starting from the same page. Um, so first of all, how do you define household management? Well, yeah, this is a very difficult question to be honest, because I would say that the definition is so broad, household management. It really depends on the perspective on which we want to define it from. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, because my background is engineering, I will like to define it from an engineering perspective, of course. Okay. I see that household management or house management is sort of like a set of activities or processes to effectively managing your residential building or a house. Uh, and it's thus from the planning or the design of the house and then the construction, but also the operational of the house, of course. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people are only look the uh, house management within the operational scope, but it's really important to see uh, before that, which is the design of the house and also the construction of the house. And it's also really important to incorporate eco-friendly practices into house management. Because we're talking about right now more and more people concerned. The government also concerned more about sustainability. So really important to incorporate eco-friendly practice in our house management. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, I think, you know, most people sort of have an idea a little bit of what sustainability and eco-friendly means, but could you define those two terms? Yeah, definitely. Uh, eco-friendly house can be defined as a residential building that has a focus on minimizing the resources used, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, such as energy, water, and also at the same time, also minimize the waste generated. So to put it simply, it's really revolves around energy, water, and waste. We try to minimize the consumption of energy, the consumption of water, and also the waste generation. Uh, but it's also important to note that uh, eco-friendly house has to fulfill its primary role, which is to provide comfortable living space for everyone. Mm. And what about sustainability? Is that sort of a similar thing or slightly different? Well, sustainability uh, can, you know, just, I would say that's the same with there's some intersections there. Because when we talk about sustainability, you talk about how you manage the resources and how you manage the waste, okay? Mm -hmm. and. Uh, when we talk also about eco-friendly, as I mentioned before, that it really has to be focused on how we minimize our uh, energy consumption and water consumption. And that's highly related to sustainability. I believe that mm -hmm. there are some intersections there. So I would say that eco-friendly house must be sustainable. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Um, so... 
What are some sort of characteristics that make a house more eco-friendly, more sustainable than your conventional house? Well, again, this same story with the definition mm-hmm. of eco-friendly house, very broad. But mm. from an engineering perspective, uh, I would say that those three factors, energy consumption, uh, so an eco-friendly house should be energy efficient. And then in terms of water consumption, also we need to be water efficient as well in an eco-friendly house. And then in terms of waste, need to minimize the waste as well. So I will start with the first point first probably in terms of energy efficiency. So an eco-friendly house needs to be energy efficient, means that first of all, we use the energy wisely. That's really important. I'll start with the behavior point. Uh, there might be some technologies that can help to improve the energy efficiency, but I would say that behavior, the way how we use energy in our house is really the primary determining factors in determining the or defining the eco-friendly house. Uh, although it can be supported by technology, for example, you can, uh, in an eco-friendly house, you can integrate renewable energy. Solar panel is not expensive anymore. Uh, and you can definitely easily install it and then couple it with battery or other energy storage to basically supply the electricity of the house. And then another thing that is really important is actually to choose house appliances that has good energy rating. You know, when we buy electronics, now they have the energy ratings, right? By Energy Star. So you really need to pay attention to that as well. And then the second thing is water consumption. Same thing. It's about behavior, how we use water, especially here in Australia. I was here in 2019. I think uh, the, the summer was terrible at that time. And we really need to uh, use water wisely because the, 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 the price of water at that time is very expensive. And yeah, I think especially in the region that susceptible to drought, it's really important for household to really uh, look into their water consumption, use water wisely. And similar with the, the, the energy things that, uh, there are some technologies that can support, uh, the water efficiency of a house. For example, not sure if you've heard of this kind of technology, like we can actually harvest rainwater and then, hmm. you know, filter the rainwater and then use it for general purpose in a house. That's definitely uh, something that can minimize, uh, our water consumption. And then finally, also waste is also about, you know, behavior on how we try to manage our waste, separating different kinds of waste and then uh, minimizing the single use product usage is also important in uh, reducing our waste generation in our household. And so some of this, you know, you were saying it's, it's a lot of this is behavior based. So, you know, things like, um, choosing not to have single use plastics and maybe running the water less when you have a shower, but some of this can be built into our homes, you know, before we move in. So what, what is, um, why should we, why should we, um, have these in our homes and why should we, you know, incorporate this into our behaviors? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I think the one that I mentioned is mostly about behavior, right? And also mm-hmm. about how we operate the house. But again, mm-hmm. I think you referred to my first point that actually is also about the construction as well. When do we really design our house properly to be an eco-friendly house, right? So uh, I think it's also really important when we're designing, we look into the design that can minimize the energy consumption. For example, I will, I will give one example. Uh, for air conditioning, air conditioning is one of the high energy consumption in our household, okay? Mm-hmm. Either for heating or cooling, depending on the season, but it requires a lot of energy. So uh, by, you know, selecting the insulation materials of the house and then designing the ethics, the, the structure of the house, you can actually improve the airflow and therefore you can minimize the energy needed to, uh, for, for air conditioning in the house. So definitely agree that construct during the construction and also the planning of the house, we really need to think about eco-friendly and talking about the benefits, uh, of, you know, building an eco-friendly house. I would say, first of all, as the name implies is the environmental benefit, because, uh, 
Uh, I'll give you a bit of statistic if that's okay. So uh, you you'll be surprised because when I look into the data, it's very surprising. Uh, the greenhouse gas emission from you know household sector is actually crazy. I would say crazy, insane. It's insane. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, it's about thirty percent of global greenhouse gas emissions. Mm -hmm. So thirty percent of global greenhouse gas emission actually coming from electricity that is intended to use in residential building sector. That's a crazy number. Thirty percent of our global greenhouse gas emissions. So. If you think about that, our small step in household, in making our household or house is sustainable and eco-friendly, can make a big impact in the environment, like reducing the carbon dioxide emissions. So that's the most apparent one, I would say, environmental benefits. And then the other benefits would be like economic benefits, saving your money, definitely. Because as I mentioned, it's about energy efficiency and water efficiency, so it will help you a lot in save costs for your electricity bill and water bill. Although mm. the drawback or the obstacle that people uh, often see in building an eco-friendly house is the high capital cost, okay? So, so the initial capital cost is quite high because you need some technologies there. You need a proper design for that. And also you need to buy appliances that have good energy rating or water rating. So. But if we like co compare between the advantage and disadvantage, I would say that the advantage actually outweighs the disadvantage. And then the other thing is also it's good for your health and also mental, uh, mental health uh, or well-being. Because usually or typically, uh, eco-friendly house in also incorporate green spaces. When you have green spaces, mm. you have like trees and other stuff. It will improve the air quality in your house, definitely. That's the first thing. And also it will unconsciously probably affect your mental health as well. Amazing. So, yeah, there are a lot of benefits in eco-friendly house. So definitely mm -hmm. worth to consider to, you know, incorporate some eco-friendly practices in house. So how do green spaces impact, you know, an eco-friendly house? How does it make it eco-friendly? Um, other than maybe, you know, some fresh air and a bit of greenery around us. Yep. I think I think green space not only about three, okay? Not only about three. You can definitely use green space for other things as well that can support your house to be an eco-friendly one. So one example is the harvesting the uh, rainwater that I mentioned before. Mm -hmm. You need green space for that because soil is a very good water absorber, right? And then you can harvest the water from that and then filter it using like very simple instrument or technology basically so that you can minimize your water consumption. That's the first thing. Also, uh, I think indirectly, you can also use your uh, green space to grow your own fruits and vegetables. It will definitely impact or re help you reduce your carbon footprint as well because you don't need to go to somewhere else to get the fruit and vegetables, but you can just grab it from your green space from your bed, yeah, and then, yeah, use it for your daily lives. So I think you really need to, you know, be thoughtful, I guess, when you decide your green space, not only about planting tree, but make use, like a good use for the green space. You can also even integrate renewable energy in the green space. So for hmm. example, like you can uh, put wind turbine, probably solar panel, usually we install it on the roof, right? But in the green space, you can, install a wind turbine, for example, for, to provide small amount of electricity. In just a, in just a normal, I don't know, a, a small green space, you know, in a small house, you can install a wind turbine. Yes, that, that, so wind turbine is not necessarily to be a very large scale, but there are also some wind turbines that are small scale that can provide a small amount of electricity, or even you can build a like, mini hydropower plant in your house. There's a possibility as well that, and yeah, I had no idea. I'm going to have to look up um, wind turbines for houses. I think they're going to be so cute. <laughs> Thank you. And um, like, how do we go about building these green spaces? Because um, is it just is it just a matter of, you know, um, doing a bit of gardening or do we need to be a bit more thoughtful about how we're planning the garden, the green space? 
yeah, I think that depends on the space that we have as well, right? Because uh, land limitation is another issue as well when you're planning a house, I would say. But I think there's some technology in planting or something uh, when you want to make a green space. Like for example, there is a technology hydroponic or aeroponic even technology that can save, you know, the space needed to build that green spaces. So I think try as best as possible to incorporate green spaces. Mm -hmm. And if you have difficulties with the, you know, land availability, you can definitely consider vertical gardening or vertical green space like through hydroponic or aeroponic technology. Great, thank you. Um, and what about, you know, I think most people aren't don't have the opportunity to build a house. You know, they're renting or they're moving into an existing house. What are some ways that we can, other than, you know, maybe creating a garden, um, what are some ways that we can um, incorporate some more eco-friendly design into the home? Yep, okay. I think... Uh, if it's renting, it's probably a bit difficult, right? Because you cannot like renovate the house as mm. much as you want. Probably it's very limited. Yeah, but so just maybe behavioral then. I think I think the main point is behavior things. Mm -hmm. That's one point, and you know, uh, I would say that in terms of waste, you still can do it properly with reduction, like minimizing the waste that you generate. And also probably if possible, like re to recycle or even upcycle. For example, if you have kitchen or food waste, you can definitely make a valuable product out of it. Like for example, through a process called composting, you can make a fertilizer to be used for, mm. you know, many kind of different kind of purposes. For your new green space. Yes. You, yes. But I believe that a house, you, you cannot have a green space, right? But if, mm -hmm. even if you don't, you can incorporate it like in a pot. Like some mm -hmm. trees, small yeah. trees should be fine. And so do you have any tips on, you know, how to, how to reduce your waste? You know, you mentioned recycling. Um, any sort of tips in that area? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so in terms of waste reduction, I, would, uh, I think the first thing is about behavior, as I said before. Uh, and also I think the approach is 3R. If I, I have to give a suggestion, it's 3R. You try to... First of all, to reduce the waste. And then the second thing is try to reuse if it's possible. And then the third thing is recycle. And also I think the practice that we want to do in a house uh, in terms of waste management is also about separating different kinds of waste. Because that's going to help how we process waste in the municipality level, for example. Okay, so we need to, you know, differentiate waste based on the category like organic waste, inorganic waste, and then electronic waste. If electronic waste is also a big issue, right? Because uh, it's toxic and other stuff. So really need to separate that. And if it's possible to recycle yourself to the recycle yourself, that's a fun activity. Uh, even if it's not possible, there are a lot of recycling centers, right? right now so you can definitely bring your the, the waste the recyclable waste to the recycling centers and then you can get some money out of it as well so it's a really good practice in separating waste and also like recycling mm -hmm, great yeah my local council recently changed from just having one communal um recycling to having glass separate which i'm, I'm sure is really great for them but we haven't quite gotten our kitchen set up for that and so it's a bit complex trying to keep yeah. the glass out of the um out of the normal recycling yeah. now i'm also surprised actually in new salt as now there are a lot of recycling centers as well mm -hmm. it's supposed to be far away from my house like you know far away from my house but it's not just next like in my suburbs around the suburbs so it's really good mm, that's really good because yeah i'm i've got some e-waste and i'm like thinking I have to take it somewhere, where do I take it? And if it's really far away, I'm not going to do it. Um, it's about making it convenient. Yeah, I think that's the one challenge that the government face, is facing at the moment, right? How to decentralizing that recycling facilities so that people wants to, you know, I think people wants to recycle, but the thing is, if it's make it makes life harder, people don't want to do it, right? So, yeah. And what are some other challenges that, you know, households can face when they're trying to make their house more eco-friendly? 
Well, I think uh, one of the challenges is definitely cost, as I said before, because the cost is definitely will be higher compared to a uh, conventional house, obviously, because you need some investment on the technology and appliances. And other stuff is probably, I would say, uh, the government regulation can sometimes be a hindrance. So probably not in Australia, because Australia is like, you know, an advanced country as well. We a uh, very high uh, awareness on sustainability, but in some countries, like for example, back in my home country in Indonesia, some regulation actually like uh, limit people to, you know, build an eco-friendly house. For example, just to integrate solar panel, that's a big issue, you know, because it's not easy. You, uh, there, there are some regulations that needs to be uh, make sure that we don't uh, violate the regulations. That's the thing. So I think really important for the government as well to provide policies that can actually support, you know, green initiatives in our society, in the household. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, renewable electricity generations. Hmm. So unfortunately, maybe not quite something that us and as individuals can tackle, but maybe, you know, through some petitioning to the government, we can hopefully get some better, some better policies. Yeah, absolutely. But I think mm -hmm. here in Australia, you can definitely still, you know, yeah. build that because the regulation is really supportive. And I think I heard that there are some countries that provide incentives even for people who wants uh, to build an eco-friendly house. So that's really amazing and something that we need to, uh, Think about and also the other government across the world think about as well. Mm. And um, have you noticed sort of any any tr uh, changes or trends in the last few years? You know, we've in Australia we're pretty good, but you know, any other trends that you've seen um, towards eco friendly houses that we should be looking out for? Uh, I think the focus so far is mainly on the operational. And our discussion, to be honest, is tends to be on the operational of the eco friendly house. But I think nowadays people think about uh, the construction process as well. So specifically about the building materials, okay? Specifically about the building materials. People tend to use like, right now, uh, there are a lot of innovation in developing sustainable building materials uh, that doesn't compromise the quality, of course. So for example, back in Indonesia, I would say, uh, in Bandung, uh, there are a house that is made from a plastic bottles, which is very interesting. They they use recycled plastic bottle about thirty thousands, and then they made a house of it. And as you know, that Indonesia has a very high risk of earthquake, so that kind of they they develop the materials from plastic bottle, and it's earthquake resistance. That's the good thing. Mm -hmm. And also the good thing is also maintenance is very easy. It's very easy. So I think more focus should be devoted into to. Uh, developing sus more sustainable building materials because uh, the carbon footprint for building materials is also quite high, especially to, you know, to generate, for example, concrete or cement. It's very, like, requires a lot of energy and emits a lot of CO2. So trying to uh, build uh, sustainable building materials is very important. Also, another thing, uh, one research that we're doing in our research group is actually uh, developing uh, building materials from CO2. So you, you, you will be surprised that we can actually make uh, building materials from CO2. So the process is basically capturing CO2 from emissions point. So for example, you have an industry that emits a lot of CO2, you capture it, and then you basically react with, you know, certain chemicals, and then you can make carbonate. And that carbonate can actually be uh, the, the part of the construction of the house. Amazing. I had no idea. I mean, it's like turning air into materials. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. It's really the one. It's still like in the development process, but if it works, we definitely can, you know, uh, cut the CO2 emissions significantly. Yeah. Um, I mean, you, you might not be quite there yet, but have you made anything? Um, have you made anything interesting yet or a bit too, too soon in the um, research? Actually, in terms of research, we still made like a brick, in, uh, like the form is still a brick, but we haven't really demonstrated that, you know, for a real house. But because the process is actually still very new, and I would say that mm -hmm. the capital cost is still high because there is still 
uh, some improvement needs to be done mm-hmm. in order to the pro- in order for the process to be commercially viable. I imagine it would take a lot of energy to to do this process. Yes, you can imagine you you need to extract CO two from the air. That's gonna you know cost you a lot of energy, definitely. Okay, and that'll create more CO two. Yes, but if we source the energy from renewable energy, that's a different story, right? Oh, that's true. That's true. Interesting. I look forward to learning more about this, and maybe one day I'll have a house made out of CO two emissions. Yeah, that sounds good. Amazing. Yeah. Um. Great. So thank you for sharing all of those. Um, thank you for sharing your research. Um, now, I'd like to learn uh, what are some practices that you do in your own home that from your research, from your work um, that you use to manage the sustainability of your own home? Well, yeah. Thank you so much for the question. This is a really interesting question and always an important question because uh, as an individual, right, this is kind of like a takeaways points on how we can make an eco-friendly house. I would say that the easiest way is to build a good habit or an eco-friendly habit, okay? Starting from simple one, like for example, unplug your power, your electronics, unplug the power, turn off the light. To be honest, I, you know, a type of person who tends to forget things easily as well. So sometimes forget to turn off light, unplug power, and that actually costs a lot of energy, in fact because uh, there is what's called uh, phantom energy consumption or electricity consumption. So that's a serious issue. Uh, but I think behavioral just can be difficult for, you know, many people. But luckily, we have technology to help. Okay, So for example, in my accommodation, I put a smart technology, like a smart home technology with, can you know automatically turn off the lamp and uh, you know the PowerPoint for example, so that really helps you know change uh, our energy consumption. Mm-hmm. So that's one example. And so I'm, I'm guessing it's not one of the ones where you have to move for it to you, to work because I've been in work situations where every thirty minutes um, the lights will turn off because you haven't moved. Um, no, it's not like on. A- no, it's not Is like it that. Like a timer situation. You you can definitely set up like that, but I prefer like you know in a phone that you can control it whether your lamp is on or off. And in when you are in the office, then you can check. Oh, I forgot to turn it on. Turn it off. Then you turn it on. I don't really like that. It's automatically you know. Mm. It's a bit annoying to be yeah. honest. Yeah, that's great because um, I mean I've been in I've you know I've been driving to work and then I'm like did I remember to turn the oven off? And if I could just turn the oven off manually on my phone, that would be amazing. No more worries. Absolutely. I think the technology right now can really help us to overcome our, you know, happy tools. Just because changing happy is not easy, to be honest. Changing happy is not easy, especially for a forgetful person like me, right? But mm-hmm. technology can help, definitely. Yeah. And how long did it take you to set up the technology? Was it a difficult uh, process? No, it's not. It's not. It's not difficult. You can actually, you know, use the existing technology like uh, Alexa or for Amazon or Google Nest, if not mistaken. I use I'm not from Amazon, but yeah, you can definitely connect. It, but it's just uh, you need a very good uh, connection system in the house as well. Mm-hmm. It's okay. not. It's not really. It's not. It doesn't cost that much as well right now. Great. Thank you for that. Um, I'm going to have to have a look and see if I can do that um, in my house. So we've got some questions from the audience now. Um, So the first question um, that we have is, what are some creative ways homeowners can integrate recycling into their daily routines uh, beyond the standard of separate bins for different waste? Okay. So about recycling, right? The question. Uh, I would say uh, you can do the recycling yourself if it's possible, definitely, right? Mm Mm-hmm. But if sometimes it's hard, as I say, go to recycle centers. But I think the most easiest, the, the easiest one is composting. That's the, you know, conventional one. You can turn your food waste or any compostable waste into fertilizer, and then you can use it for your green space or you can sell it as well. I would think that people need to think not only about recycle right now. We need to think more about upcycle. 
Okay, hmm. a plot run of cycle. How to so I've cycled basically same thing with recycle, but with recycle sometimes the value of the product is lower than the original product, or probably the same. But we up cycle we focus on you know uh, add value to the to the product on back to the waste as well. So one thing that we can do is all definitely composting. Composting is a major technology, and it's already like available anywhere. It's easy to be integrated in a house as well. And we actually have um, a minute, an episode about composting, so uh, we'll put the show note. Uh, we'll put the um, link for that in the show notes, so you can find out how to compost yourself um, in um, in our in our podcast. Um, so our second question, um, and this is sort of related to this. Um, they, they say the thought of maintaining green spaces seems to be overwhelming, especially for those with a busy schedule. Are there ways for people to have a green space without having to dedicate a great amount of time and energy? Well, yeah, maintaining green space can take like, yeah, need, need commitment, I would say. But I think that again, uh, there are some smart technology that can automatically do the job like watering system. I think people already developed that. We can always integrate technology if it's possible. Also, the second thing is also depends on the plants that, you know, we uh, put in our green spaces as well. If you don't have like too many times to commit to your green spaces, then just kind of plants or trees that, you know, doesn't need very much attention, you know, or care. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So probably not... Um you know, some, something that needs pruning every second day. Yes. Yes. That's true. Mm. Thank you for that. Um, and for our open mic now, um, this is a chance for you to talk about something that you're passionate about, um, that can be related to our topic, but it doesn't have to be. Did you have something in mind for that? Yeah, absolutely. I would like to share one of our research that we're doing. We actually, so our research group, basically, uh, the focus is on a technology called power to x so power is basically electricity you you can source the electricity like from solar panel wind turbine etc and you know that's source of energy you can easily install in a household right so for example a like solar panel you can just put solar panels on the roof the and then 2x x is basically chemicals we live with a lot of chemicals like for example cleaning products cleaning products uh contains like for example hydrogen peroxide okay which is a very famous disinfectant so one of our research is actually trying to make a decentralized or on-site hydrogen peroxide so you can make your own cleaning product using renewable ah. electricity so the process is very simple actually you you have renewable electricity and then you have water and oxygen from the air and then you can react these three things in a reactor called electrolyzer and then you make hydrogen peroxide and you know you can use the hydrogen peroxide for example for cleaning uh, solution or probably for disinfection and other stuff there are a lot of application for hydrogen peroxide so and, and we probably, we can also extend to other chemicals as well. Like you can also make your own fertilizer from air, water, and renewable electricity. So that's something that we're looking into. So I think this is very important, I would say, because the problem with solar panel is, you know, uh, at day, you have like very, a lot of energy generated, but at night, you cannot generate electricity because the sun is not up. So the, how, how we store the energy during the day, because during the day, people usually go out for work, uh, but the, and then it generates a lot of electricity, but the thing is people is not at home. The energy demand is slow. So how we store the excess electricity into something useful. So we can store it as a chemicals and that chemicals can be used for our daily life. So that's the concept of this technology called power to X. So okay. hopefully in the future, you will see this technology can be deployed in household. And are you saying that like every household would just have their own um, little uh, chemical processing uh, machine that would create their... It will be like a device, a small device at which coupled with solar panel or other renewable sources in a house. 
That's that's good. But I also I'm a little worried because um, I mean, maybe it's just me, but I've seen lots of YouTube videos or uh, Instagram videos of people mixing um, chemicals for cleaning and then creating like chlorine gas. Um, okay. So yeah, yeah, this is, <laughs> I think, I think chlorine as a cleaning, you know, cleaning solution, it's not safe definitely, but hydrogen peroxide is really safe. And also the okay. process producing the hydrogen peroxide, these chemicals in a very diluted concentration. Because usually with cleaning purpose, you don't need very concentrated or high concentration of hydrogen mm -hmm. peroxide. It's very diluted, so it's very safe. It's ah. definitely safer th than chlorine that you mentioned. So, yeah, definitely. Okay, that's a, that's that makes me that makes me feel better because I was a little bit like, um, I mean, as a kid, I I drank things I was not supposed to drink. <laughs> yeah. We, we, we always try to make the process as safe as possible. The device, I would say the device, because uh, I suppose that if you want to install it in a household, it, should be, it shouldn't take too much space in a house, right? So mm -hmm. we, we, we think it as a device rather than like take a lot of space in the house, like building a big reactor or something, no, but it's, it will be like a small device. That can that's sort of like a portable device, I would say. That can generate small amount of that cleaning solution. That can hmm. at least fulfill the demand from one household. Great, that sounds great. I I'm looking forward to seeing that. Uh, maybe I'll have one in my own house. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for sharing your research as well. Um, and if our if our listeners want to find out more about you and your work, where can they find you? Well, yeah, thank you so much. So. Uh, if you want to know more about myself and my research, you can, uh, you know, reach out me in via LinkedIn. My name is Danny Kunawan. Just, you know, type in or Google it, or you can send me an email to danny.kunawan at unsw.a2.au. I'll be very happy to discuss or, you know, to answer any question revolving around sustainability in your house or maybe in the energy topic and other topic as long as it's for sustainability, which is one of my passion. So yeah, feel free to reach me out and happy to discuss or collaborate in similar events. Great, thank you so much. Uh, and we'll put those links in our show notes uh, so you can find them nice and easy. Thank you so much for joining me today. You've been listening to On The House, produced by the Household Management Science Labs, a division of LMSL, the Life Management Science Labs. More episodes like this from across 10 life management perspectives can be found by searching LMSL on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, and other podcasting apps available on your smart devices. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider rating our show, sharing it, and subscribing to our channel as it helps other people find it so we can grow and bring you more quality resources. More of our work can be found on our website at hm dot lmsl.net where you can join our movement i'm gabriella yastra thanks for tuning in